Thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Implementing RFID Without Turning Your Library Upside Down. When your library implements an RFID system, the RFID tag is the least expensive piece of hardware, but with tens or hundreds of thousands of tags to be placed, tagging your collection is the stage of implementation that will take the most time and has the most potential to disrupt staff workflows and interfere with patron access to your collection. We're broadcasting today from Provo, Utah and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I'm Thomas Forsyth, sales representative for the Northeast at Backstage Library Works, and I'd like to introduce today's presenter. Jacob Bastian is Vice President of Onsite Services for Backstage Library Works, and in this role is responsible for the operations of our RFID tagging services. Jacob has experience in managing projects from small public libraries in California all the way to large academic libraries in Europe. We will be recording today's presentation, and that recording along with the slides will be available to you in a couple of weeks. We'll email you a link. On your screen, you can adjust the relative size of elements by clicking on the gray bar between the presentation slides and the camera feeds and dragging that separator up or down. Attendees lines are muted, so please direct any questions or comments through the questions window. So without further ado, Jacob, tell us about RFID. All right, thanks, Thomas. So as Thomas just explained, today I'm going to be talking about uh, undertaking a project to tag an entire library collection with new RFID tags. Specifically, I'm going to be discussing disruptions libraries can expect to encounter when undertaking an RFID tagging project and how best to plan for them. So, as we all know, installing a new RFID system in your library is an exciting undertaking. It moves the library technologically forward, advances security, and increases circulation efficiency and patron privacy. However, out of all the elements of installing a new RFID system into a library, the project to tag your entire physical collection is the most time consuming. Therefore, it's vital to plan for when that time will be allocated to tagging and who will be assigned to it. Now, typically libraries have two options when it comes to deciding who will undertake the tagging project. The first option is to complete the project in-house utilizing the library's own staff time. And the second option is to outsource the work to an outside vendor to come on site and complete the work. However, either way, there will be some disruptions to the day-to-day -day work of your library while the project is underway. Now, before we get into the specifics of those disruptions, uh, I'd like to get an idea of where everyone is in their RFID plans. So there's gonna be a poll coming up asking, where are you in planning for or implementing RFID? All right, so it looks like we have 57% um, of our audience is just curious about RFID. 22% are making plans, considering specs or creating RFPs. 10% are in the procurement process, evaluating vendors and systems. 10% are in process of implementation, and 1% are already in place. Thank you for taking the time to answer our poll. Thanks everyone. Um, so it sounds like most of you are just sort of considering RFID. It's never too early to start thinking about some of the concepts we're gonna discuss in this webinar. Planning it ahead of time for these things is vital to making sure that an RFID tagging project is a success. So let's start with staff, staff time. Now, as I mentioned, RFID tagging takes time. It's important to know just how long it's going to take because this helps to understand how much staff time will be needed and utilizing staff time disrupts their ability to perform their typical day-to-day -day tasks. Now, in planning for how long it's going to take, you need to consider a few points of information about your staff's capabilities and your library's needs, as, such as the uh, number of branches that are going to be tagged, the number of items in each of those branches, the number of staff that are available to work on the tagging, and the amount of time they're uh, available throughout the day at, or can be made available. Um, the number of RFID encoding stations you have for use during the project, 
and each tagger's uh, production speed capabilities. Now, in considering this last point, um, there's a quote from Martin Palmer's book, Making the Most of RFID in Libraries, where they indicate that one minute per item or 60 items per hour is a good starting point in considering how fast library staff can typically tag a collection. Now, I'd also like to note that when I mention staff, I don't exclusively mean library employees. Tagging can also be done utilizing volunteers and or even students if available. So once you have the points of information gathered, you can perform a simple calculation to figure out how long an RFID tagging project is going to take. Now let's say, for example, that a library with 40,000 items has two full-time staff, full-time being 40 hours a week, available to do the tagging work at the expected tagging rate of 60 items an hour. Calculating this information tells us that this library in its situation would take just a bit longer than eight weeks to completely tag the entire collection. Now keep in mind that you can tweak some of the variables such as staff available and hours spent tagging per staff member if you're able to in order to decrease the amount of time to complete the project. So let's go back to that example and change a couple things. Let's say that the library with 40,000 items could instead utilize six full-time staff members instead of just two. With the larger workforce, the project could be completed in under three weeks. Now, in addition to staff time being spent tagging, um, someone's going to have to take on the role of project manager. A project management is an important aspect of any RFID tagging project in order to properly see to the completion of the project. A project manager dedicated to organizing and overseeing a tag tagging project will need to spend time training and supervising all the staff doing the tagging, uh, tracking taggers' individual rates of production. So this is to make sure that tagging is being done and the project will be completed on schedule, uh, performing regular quality checks on all tagging being done to make sure that tags are being smoothed out, placed in the proper position, encoded properly, and that all, time, all items are placed back neatly and in order. And finally, they spend a lot of time communicating with other library departments and staff to make sure tagging work doesn't disrupt other library services as much as is possible. Now, when selecting a project manager to carry out the RFID tagging project, uh, someone should be selected with strong communication, organizational, planning, interpersonal, and time management skills. So now that we've discussed staff, Another disruption to the library created from RFID tagging project is circulation and floating collections workflows. Uh, this is because during and even after the tagging project, items will continue to be checked in and out of the library. And especially at the beginning of the project, most if not all items being returned will not have been tagged. Now some of the, these items will belong to sections within the library that have already completed tagging and therefore will need to be tagged before being reshelved. Now there are typically two circulation workflows methods that can be implemented during a tagging project to resolve this issue with minimal disruption. So the first idea, uh, which I like to call the whiteboard method, involves the project manager setting up a whiteboard or chalkboard or large paper pad or even a Google Doc online, um, something convenient, something near, in, or behind the circulation desk. The whiteboard would be clearly and easily visible to all circulation staff responsible for sorting and shelving returned items. Now on the whiteboard, the project manager will list every section of the library, either by call number or section title, broken down into the following categories. First, completed, and this would be all areas of the library that have been fully tagged. In progress, which would be all the areas of the library that are currently being tagged, and to do. And these would be areas that have not even been tagged a single item yet. Now, before sorting and or shelving returned items, uh, circulation staff should consult the whiteboard. Any item going to a completed section first has to be tagged before being reshelved. Any items going to sections currently in progress should be tagged and held on to until that section has been finished, at which point it can then be reshelved. Any items that are returned and going to sections that haven't been tagged yet can just be reshelved normally. 
Now, every day or possibly twice a day, if need be, the project manager should update this whiteboard with the latest information on where the tagging team is currently working. So the other method is the tag them all method. Um, this involves just immediately tagging any and all returned items that are not already tagged and reshelving them, regardless of where the tagging team is currently working within the collection. This method is much more efficient and much less disruptive than the whiteboard method. However, it does come with some risks. For example, if a tagger comes across an RFID tagged item within a range of books thought not to, yet to be tagged, they might assume the rest of the section has already been done by someone else and just skip it. Or a tagger might, might not notice that a random book has already been tagged that was returned, tagged, and reshelved, and they could accidentally double tag it. Now these risks could be avoided by instructing the taggers to first check all books for tags before tagging them, but this would drastically slow down the tagging project, thus prolonging the project's timeline. So now that we've talked about staff time as a disruption and uh, circulation workflows, before we move on, I'd like to pause and answer any questions some, anyone might have so far. Jacob, while we're waiting on people to type any questions they may have, I'd like to start off with um, asking you if there's any methods you recommend for marking a book on the outside if the library is willing to do so. So that's a good little thing to cover real quick. Um, I do recommend if you are, if your library has no policies against it, marking the top of the text block of your book every time it's tagged. That way it's very easy to quickly see which books have been tagged and which books have not. You can use a black Sharpie or I've even seen some libraries use a little rubber stamp check mark to mark the top of the text block. It really helps circulation staff in quickly identifying what has and has not been tagged yet during a project. Alessandra Hull is wondering if you could quickly re-explain the tag them all method. The tag them all method, sure. So the tag them all method, just to sum up, um, is essentially every time an item is returned to the library, you just assess whether or not the item has already been tagged, and if not, you just tag it, regardless of where we are, uh, the team is currently tagging within the library and shelving it into the, that section. So what this does is it makes a quick, easy workflow for circulation staff to follow. Just tag the item as it comes in and then reshelve it as normal. But the problem is you're now reshelving items that have already been tagged into sections that have not been tagged on the shelves. So this can create some confusion for the tagging technicians. It is a method that some libraries choose to use, however. Uh, Melanie Duncan is wondering, what method would you recommend if you plan to tag while your library is closed to the public? So that's a great question. Um, we are actually going to get into specifics about whether or not you should close a library during a tagging project. Um, but closing, just briefly, closing the library does offer an opportunity for you to utilize a large team and get the tagging project done much quickly because you don't have to worry about being in patron's way during the tagging process. But again, I'm going to cover that a bit later in the webinar. Daniel Alvarez is wondering, where are, you, where are usually tags located in the item? So tags are typically placed on the inside back cover. Um, they are staggered in three locations so that they don't interfere with each other if you're reading three different uh, tag, three different items at the same time stacked on each other. Um, I have seen them also placed on the inside front cover, but the back cover is usually preferred for security purposes. You also want to place it as close to the spine or the gutter if the book's open as possible so that if you're using an inventory RFID wand, you can quickly scan over. If it's too close to the uh, fore edge of the book, it might not read it. Ernie Gillis is wondering if there's any kind of combination hybrid situation you'd recommend for whiteboard and tag them all? Um, that's a good question. It would depend. Every library has a unique, typically has a unique circulation situation and it kind of comes down to the project manager overseeing the project to work with the specific circulation setup a library has. Um, a hybrid could be where 
maybe you don't want to hold on to some material to wait until it's finished so you tag ahead of time i would just highly recommend that if you are shelving any books that have been tagged into sections that have not had their shelves tagged yet make sure your taggers are aware that's the best way for them to look out for not double tagging something as well as just deciding, oh, well, this has already been tagged. I should go to a different section and tag that one instead. But again, um, it, it comes down to the unique situation of it, every library's uh, circulation workflow. Rachel D'Agostino uh, is wondering if the one minute per item estimate is for the physical labor of tagging only and not anything to do with editing or updating the catalog. It does not include editing and updating the catalog. It includes the time that it takes for staff to get used to the process. And it also includes time for, the, for staff to make sure that all of the books are placed back neatly. And again, th that was a time that was provided in Martin Palmer's book, um, recommended based on their uh, research and anecdotal evidence from other libraries that have done this. Now that also accounts for um, library staff being approached by patrons during that and being distracted by their other library duties, um, pulling them away from tagging. And one last question before we move on, and a reminder to everyone, we will have another Q&A at the end, so you will have more time to ask questions. Uh, Julie Rutherford is wondering, so are the stagger tags required to work the scanner? If so, how do you know the patrons won't incidentally choose multiple books with tags in the same place? It's, it's, um, so the, the staggering is not for the, for the uh, inventory wand or inventory scanner. It is for uh, mostly the self-checkout kiosks as well as just the general uh, RFID pad. Um, it's when you place a stack of books, you know, four or five high on top of it. If all of the RFID tags are on top of each other, one or two could block the very top ones. Now, you may it may become unlucky that a that a library patron grabs four or five books that just happen to have tags in the same spot but you lower the chances of that happening if you stagger them um, throughout the project of tagging all right thank you jacob we'll be moving on all right thanks thomas all right, so now uh, we're going to talk about some potential delays. Now, like all projects, an RFID tagging project is a temporary undertaking. As such, the disruptions to daily library workflows and services is also temporary. However, any delays in the project work will unfortunately extend how long these disruptions will be in place. It's important to be aware of some unique characteristics libraries may contain that could potentially cause delays in the tagging project. As examples, I'll, I will review three most common things that cause slowdowns in tagging, such as legacy tags, locked AV cases, and unusual or atypical library items. <clears throat> so legacy tags are RFID tags that are already attached to items from previous RFID systems. Now, these tags have to be removed or disabled in some way as not to interfere with the new RFID tags. The extra time it takes to remove or disable the, the legacy tags, especially when it has to be done to every item in the entire library, will dramatically slow down a tagger's production rate and it needs to be accounted for when planning for the project's timeline. I would like to note that when I talk about legacy tags, this does not include security strips or tattle tape as they're commonly known. We have found that those do not interfere with RFID tags but we're mostly talking about checkpoint tags like you see in the picture on the slide. Now locking cases for audiovisual items such as DVDs and Blu-ray significantly slow down tagging work, especially if a tagger has to unlock and relock each case every time they tag an AV item. While it's still time consuming, it's much more efficient to have someone go through the entire AV, selection, AV section and unlock all the cases prior to tagging. Um, tag them all and then relock them all afterwards. Now, if there's a concern about security while the cases are unlocked for tagging, you might want to consider temporarily closing down the AV section while it's being tagged. And again, I'm going to discuss more on closures later in the webinar. The third thing that could slow down tagging work is atypical or unusual library items. 
Now, tagging books and DVDs is a fairly quick process once you've gotten the hang of it. But atypical library items such as puzzles, puppets, mobile hotspots, musical instruments, tools, whatever it may be, require a tagger to carefully consider the best tagging method for each item so that the tag is readable and does not uh, damage the item. I uh, could include attaching a large hanging tag, which you then tag, or even require making spe a special housing or a bag to hold the item and tag that housing instead. Now these items require individual assessment and planning and as such need to be accounted for when you're planning a tagging project. Now the last disruption I'm going to discuss is whether or not you need to close your library for a tagging project. This is actually one of the most common questions that I receive when I discuss RFID tagging projects with people or any large on-site project for that matter. They always ask, do we need to close the library? And the short answer is almost always no. But the correct and longer answer is, well, it depends. There are typically three scenarios libraries should consider in terms of closure for an RFID tagging project. So now the first scenario is to just stay open. Um, the, and obviously this is the optimal scenario. While most libraries should have no trouble staying completely open during an RFID tagging project, there are a couple of things that need to be considered. First is that taggers need to be made aware that patrons come first. If a tagger is working in an area and a patron would like to browse that section or find a book in that section, the tagger needs to temporarily move to allow the patron to browse. And this could even mean tagging a different section for a while until the patron's finished. Also, regardless of whether the tagger is a library employee or an employee hired and supervised by a vendor that you outsource the work to, they will be asked for assistance by patrons. Patrons see someone tagging a book, so they assume they work for the library. Taggers should be trained on how best to handle patron assistance requests in a way that is both helpful and not excessively distracting to the point of affecting a tagger's ability to do their work. For example, taggers could be instructed to assist patrons with quick, easy questions such as where are the 400s or where are the bathrooms, but refer patrons to a help desk or a reference desk for more complicated inquiries. Now the second option is to temporarily close sections within the library as they're being tagged. Now this scenario mitigates the issues of patrons slowing down tagging production as I discussed previously, allowing taggers to proceed with their work uninterrupted while not forcing the library to close completely. One major aspect of this scenario that needs to be considered is that library staff would be expected to go into closed sections on behalf of patrons in order to retrieve materials when requested. Now it's vitally important that when planning section closures, a communications plan should be detailed enough to include how the temporary section closures will be announced to patrons and how signage will look for patrons as they enter the library building and around the closed section. Now the final scenario is to close the stacks or library completely for the duration of the tagging project. Now this is the most extreme scenario, but in some cases might be necessary. For example, as I mentioned earlier, if you're seeking to complete the tagging project in a short amount of time with a large workforce, it might be necessary to close it completely. Um, because a large team of taggers, especially in a small library with tight aisles, would overwhelm the stacks and users trying to navigate the stacks would both be in the way and frustrated with the disruption. Now for scheduling the closure, consideration needs to be made as to when the library is patronized the least. You should especially avoid peak use times such as in the summer for public libraries and any time during the fall or spring semesters for academic or school libraries. Now one last point on this scenario is that you should try to keep as many library services open as possible, such as interlibrary loan and reference. Staff should be able to pull material requested for pickup during this closure. Now, a great, a great way to mitigate many of the disruptions that I've discussed is to hire a vendor to complete the RFID tagging project for you. Typically, a vendor will send a highly experienced and trained project manager to your library to work with you and handle all aspects of the RFID tagging project. They'll either hire a team and hire and train a team locally to carry out the work, or they'll bring experienced staff with them to complete the project. 
Now, this option is costly, but some, some vendors have flexible pricing options in which a project manager will work with your own staff in order to complete the project. This cheaper option frees your managerial staff member that would have otherwise handled the day-to-day -day management of the RFID tagging project. However, it still uses your own staff, volunteers, or students. Now, one of the greatest benefits of hiring a vendor is that because of their previous experience in performing RFID tagging projects, vendors have unique processes that have been honed over time to complete RFID tagging at higher rates, sometimes as high as 160 items per hour, which is more than two and a half times faster than Martin Palmer uh, anecdotally mentioned that libraries can complete on themselves. Now I'd like to wrap everything up with uh, another quote from Martin Palmer's book, which is the main advantage of using an external agency is usually see seen as being the ability to specify a fixed completion date avoiding all the concerns of managing what is essentially a very mechanical process, and so being able to concentrate on more demanding elements of the project. So I wanna thank you all for um, being a great audience and patiently listening to me talk about this. Are there any other questions that anyone has at this point? Hi, Jacob. Uh, Julie Rutherford was saying, will you be discussing floating collections? There was a prior slide that we didn't go into much detail on it. Uh, libraries and their consortium have a floating large print collection, and if it's returned to us, we keep it until it goes out again. Any suggestions for how to deal with that? Are the only options to stop floating or not use RFID on that collection? So, as I mentioned earlier with circulations, a lot of libraries have unique um, workflows, and this includes floating collections. So it is sort of on a base case by case situation. It also depends on whether your library is uniquely tagging your collection only, or if all of the, the branches or locations that are involved in that uh, consortium with the floating collection are also tagging. If it's the case where they're all tagging, we would usually have a tagger set up at if there's a main branch that things go through to tag things as they go through to the various libraries. Um, I would, however, rec highly recommend when it comes to working with floating collections to mark your books, as I mentioned during the first uh, question. It's a great way to track what items have been tagged and what, what items have not been tagged. But again, this is one of those little unique things that need to be handled on a case by case and would be worked out in the project plan. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Charlotte is wondering, how large are the tags? So it depends. Um, different RFID vendors that make the RFID tags offer different sizes, but typically there are the two, uh, two inch by two inch square tags, and there's the two inch by three inch rectangular tags. Now the rectangular tags are the most popular um, because they're a bit bigger, they have a larger uh, antenna, so they have more reliable readability. Now, there are also um, what's called hub tags, which are a little circle that go around the whole of a CD. And there's also entire CD size tags that cover the entire cover art of the CD. And those are for audiovisual items. There are other unique tags at different RFID vendors, but those are the major ones that um, libraries use. Nicole is wondering, do you have any information of which tags are the best to use and or cost of the tags? Um, cost of the tags, again, will depend on the RFID vendor you go to. Um, typically, as I mentioned in the previous question, libraries use that two by three rectangular tag. As I understand it, the rectangular ones are slightly more expensive, but not very much, but they do have the advantage of the readability. And I also did think um, I would like to mention that some RFID vendors do have temporary tags, which are great for materials such as uh, magazines or newspapers that you sort of take in and, and uh, deaccession at the end of the month when you get the new one, or maybe after three months. Um, the removable tags that you can just take on and put onto the next item so that they can be circulated without wasting uh, a permanent tag. Uh, Renee, I can confirm that we will be sending out the recording to everyone. Um, anyone that registered for this webinar will be receiving a link in just a couple of weeks.
Uh, Alice Haynes is wondering, how do you recommend tagging a carton of manuscript records? So I would always recommend tagging the box that the manuscript records are in. Obviously, you probably don't want to tag the material itself. It also depends on how accessible the material is. For example, um, are you handing out individual folders of items within within the uh, the carton, or are they even in folders? It depends on the unique situation, and that's one of those things that has to be um, planned for ahead of time. And different RFID vendors do have recommendations on how best to handle uh, those unique situations with their specific RFID technologies. Connie King is wondering, do you recommend RFID over barcoding? If so, why? Especially for non-circulating libraries. So for non-circulating libraries, the two biggest advantages for RFID tagging is security and um, inventory. So security is sort of um, obvious. You put the tag in there, and if someone tries to walk away with the item, it makes the alarm go off. Um, but also for inventory, when you have RFID tags in an item, you can purchase an inventory wand from that RFID vendor. And uh, it's just like a little handheld device um, that you can just walk down the aisle of material with RFID tags and just hold it up and it scans all the items that are on that shelf. And you can confirm that against your um, catalog to make sure to see what's missing, see what isn't accounted for, see what's missing from your catalog. Now. I don't necessarily recommend having RFID instead of barcodes because barcodes still have that nice physical uh, validation that you can see on the item and scan. Also, when it comes to RFID tagging a collection, having barcodes on the item is what makes you be able to do that um, 60 item per hour for the library that sells or sometimes vendors being able to do 160 an hour. If you don't have a barcode on the items already, RFID tagging is dramatically going to be slower because you have to look up each individual item in the record to connect it to. Having the barcode already has that connection, so you're essentially connecting that barcode item ID to the RFID tag. Uh, one other comment on that, when you're using the wands, you can also use it to locate missing items. So if you are trying to pull a book for a patron and it's not where it's supposed to be, um, you can use a wand to, uh, to locate specific items uh, by just wanding over uh, different shelves until you locate it. Uh, Nicole is wondering, any information on best equipment such as RFID printers? Um, so I'm not sure what specifically you're looking for in equipment. Um, different RFID vendors have all different sort of cool things and they're still continuing to come out with some really cool things. Um, the standard equipment includes RFID gates um, for security purposes, RFID pads um, so that your employees can read the material. There's also self check-in and check-out um, stands so that patrons can walk up to the self-checkout stand, put their books onto it, scan their library card, and it checks out all the books and they can be on their way. There's also check-in shoots so that when patrons return materials, it passes over an RFID scanner and automatically checks in the item that it's back into the library. There's some RFID vendors that have book vending machines where you can actually have a book dropped right to you and it's checked out and you can put it right back into the machine. Um, now, RFID printers are um, really useful if you're thinking about putting your um, library's logo on your RFID tag to identify it if it ends up in the wrong library, for example. Um, these are all just things to consider and talk to your RFID vendor um, representative to see what might work best for your library's specific needs. Oh, one last piece of equipment I did want to mention is um, I mentioned AV locking cases earlier. Some vendors do have a uh, piece of equipment that will both simultaneously unlock a AV locked case as well as check out the item so you can hand it right to the patron and they're good to go. Lynn is wondering, what if all your library system collections float? We have a 23 library system and approximately 99% of our items float. 
Um, again, it sort of depends on whether or not you're going to be tagging all of the libraries or just your individual library. If you're tagging all of the libraries, it is essential that you mark the, the books in some way to keep track of where the RFID, which, which items are RFID tagged and which are not. You're essentially taking the method, the circulation methods that I mentioned earlier, and just amping them up between multiple libraries. We've even had some situations in the past where we have moved beyond one of the branches and send one of our taggers back to a branch we finished because all of a sudden they're receiving material through floating collections that is not tagged and they can't keep up with it. So having um, a vendor with a project manager who is aware of all the moving pieces of this is essential to making sure that libraries, after being tagged, aren't inundated with floating collections that have not yet been tagged. Um, it is important to be aware that your uh, library staff in circulation is looking out for that, those um, materials so that things don't get reshelved that haven't been tagged yet. Melanie is wondering, do you recommend heavily weeding a collection before starting an RFID conversion project? This is a great question, and I definitely recommend weeding. Um, it is very common, actually, that a library will weed a collection before beginning an RFID tagging project. Um, the biggest argument for this is, if you plan on weeding a collection eventually, don't tag it first and end up wasting those tags, especially the permanent tags, by just getting rid of the material. Um, you can even do this simultaneously. You could do a weeding project hand-in-hand -hand with an RFID tagging project. Um, but a lot more planning would go into that. However, it would be a bit more efficient. It just depends on your individual situation. Rick is wondering, if a library builds their own tagging setup slash cart, what should it include? So an RFID encoding cart includes um, typically a mobile AV cart that you could put a, um, you have a laptop on it, a barcode scanner if your collection already has barcodes, um, and it would also, it would have a battery to power the whole thing, or if necessary, a plug, a long extension cord to keep everything plugged in. And then it would have the um, specific encoding software on the laptop uh, provided by your RFID vendor. Um, you would also need the RFID encoding pad and the, um, I can't think of it now, the... Transceiver? The... Yeah, sorry, thank you, Thomas. The receiver that actually in, interprets and um, encodes the RFID tag itself. Now that communicates with the laptop and it's you need to make sure that you get the specific RFID pad that works with the tags you get from your vendor because different RFID vendors have different encryption styles. And I should mention that uh, when we do these sorts of projects, we do offer um, an option for building those carts for you if you don't want to handle it on your own. Uh, Paul is wondering, question earlier about updating the catalog. Are you programming and coding the tags as you go, or is there a separate operation after sticking all the tags? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I didn't quite get that. Um, essentially, he's wondering if you would tag the items first and then encode them later, or if you would be encoding the tags as you go as they're placed into the items. So there are actually two methods for this. Um, the first method is to have one person on an encoding station and tag the book, tag the book and um, encode it at the same time. The other method is a two-person in tandem method where someone goes ahead and places tags into the books, puts them back on the shelf, and then someone comes behind them with the encoding station and encodes the actual tag. Now, I always recommend doing the one person both tagging and encoding, because while this isn't every time, it happens at least a couple times during every RFID tagging project, sometimes tags are just faulty. They uh, were created without the antenna or the chip got damaged in transportation from the manufacturer to the library, something happens. So if you stick a tag onto a book without first trying to encode it, you risk attacking, attaching a tag to a book that is faulty, and thus you have to pull it out or disable it in a way so that you can place a correct, a working tag onto the book. Um, those are the two options, mostly. 
Um, let's see. Ernie is wondering what things should we be aware of if we mix or switch vendors of RFID tags as opposed to the hardware scanners, et cetera? Um, one thing you need to be aware of is you need to check to make sure what sort of um, what encoding is used in the tags and whether or not it's going to uh, work with the new updated equipment that you're receiving from your new vendor. And now your new RFID vendor should be able to provide you with that information. Um, a lot of times, depending on how old the RFID tags that you had already in there, it just will not work with some of the more updated equipment and as such you'll have to disable or um, remove them. In some rare cases, you can reprogram old RFID tags to work with the new system, but it's not usually the case. And part of that is due to um, ISO standards uh, were made open source uh, in the last 20 years, um, but still some vendors have their own encoding methods and you might need to wipe a tag and, and then re-encode it after. Um, Nicole is wondering, uh, what vendors do we recommend? What, who are the main players on the stage right now? So Backstage Library Works um, partners with multiple RFID vendors. And as such, we do not uh, recommend any specific vendor. Um, but I will say currently the biggest players are um, the Biblioteca, the Envisionware, PV Supa, um, MK Solutions, DTEC, um, those are just the ones off the top of my head that I can think of right now. Um, but I would, I would shop around, I would recommend shopping around and, um, you know, discussing with their representatives and seeing what, what the best fit is for you. Uh, Jocelyn, it, let's see. Uh, Ernie is wondering, systems integration awareness for catalogs to understand the RFID. How common is intermediary middleware systems to handling the RFID transactions versus the ILS? Um, so let's see, it's, it's mainly just uh, asking about um, integrating the RFID with their existing ILS. Um, and part of that is going to have to be through the vendor. Yeah, I was going to say it, it, that's going to that's going to be um, something that's going to have to be worked out through the RFID vendor um, and how it interacts with your specific ILS. Um, and and again, it just depends on the vendor that you pick. Different vendors have different uh, RFID encoding programs, software capabilities, um, and it, again, it just it just depends on the vendor you select. Um, some of them work seamlessly. Some of them require a little extra uh, scripting um, to make them work with each other. And you know, I would I would I would discuss it with the various RFID vendor con uh, representatives that you're that you're uh, considering um, before you make your choice. Charlotte is wondering: Can you use a mobile circulation unit on the cart and? Um, I believe she means turning it into a, a mobile checkout station. You you could um, you could essentially make your own mobile checkout station. All you really need is a laptop with the software on it and an RFID pad um, that that communicates with it. You could you could do that and you could set it up wherever you like. Um, vendors do also make specifically checkout stations, um, but you know. Get creative. <laughs> uh, Nathan is wondering, does Backstage have its own RFID equipment when they perform the tagging, or does the library need to coordinate with the equipment with a vendor? Uh, Backstage does not have our own. Um, we have equipment for tagging, but we do not have our own software, and we do not have the um, RFID antenna, the encoding antennas. Those have to be acquired from the RFID vendor because they have their own special encryption that they do not just hand out for security purposes. Um, however, we partner with just about all major RFID vendors in, the, in North America um, and in some other countries. And so we are happy to um, work on that process either on your behalf or with you to make sure that 
those uh, that equipment's provided for the project. Uh, Lori, and some are, I should note, some RFID vendors do also offer uh, encoding stations for the projects, and we work with those as well. Lori is wondering, do you recommend wiping tags at the time of discarding the material? Um, yes, I would recommend it mostly so that it doesn't depending on what you're doing with the material it is helpful to for example if you're handing it off to a bookseller um, like better world books or some something like that um, so that it doesn't interfere with interfere with their systems in the future um, but it's not essential it's not going to cause any sort of security problems if if it's still encoded um, and it can be as simple as just you know slicing through or removing the tag as it goes out the door and finally, Joanne is wondering, what is the lifespan of an RFID tag? That's a really good question, Joanne. Um, I'm going to have to say that it, it depends on the vendor you get it from, and I, I would ask them. I, I don't believe that I can speak for their individual tag capabilities and um, their product's quality. Um, but I, I wouldn't expect to be replacing it every year if that's your concern, you know, these tags you know, are placed and then they last most likely until you weed it again, depending on what your weeding cycle is like. But again, that's something that I would recommend discussing with your specific RFID vendor uh, representative. All right, then it looks like that's all questions. Oh, all one right. last Thank one. you everyone so much. Oh, um, one more. C Catherine just popped in with, can you explain more of the advantages of RFID over conventional barcodes and tattle tape systems in terms of inventory and security? What are some reasons libraries are choosing RFID systems? So when it comes to RFIDs versus barcodes, um, the biggest is advantage is just the efficiency that it gives you in circulation. You do not have to visually see the RFID tag in order to scan it. And you can and you can um, scan multiple books at the same time with RFID tags. Whereas barcodes, you have to clearly see the actual barcode itself. You got to angle it just right, you know. And you can only do one book at a time. Um, also, when it comes to inventory, the same thing is true. When you inventory a collection with just barcodes, you have to remove the book so that you can visually see the barcode especially if it's inside the book, you then have to open the book and scan the barcode. With RFID tags, especially if you have the inventory wand, you can just walk right down the aisle and hold that RFID wand and scan every single item as you walk down. Um, it's, a, it's much more efficient. Now, when it comes to security, um, barcodes don't offer security whatsoever, aside from that it identifies the book as that library's book. Now RFID tags, however, because they are attached and they stick to it, um, it's a, it's, they're fairly difficult. I don't know if anyone has ever tried. They're fairly difficult to pull off. Um, and it, it especially, um, because of the large antenna space on that, it has a much higher likelihood to make the alarm system go off when you're trying to walk out with it. Now also one big advantage of RFID when it comes to security is because the tags are encoded with the item ID or barcode number or however you prefer to call it um, for that specific item, if someone tries to walk out with that item, not only would it make the gates, the alarms go off, but it also keeps a log of what items it, it, it was that they tried to walk out with or successfully walked out with. So you're aware of what item is now missing. That is a large advantage to RFID over tattle tape, for example. Uh, I should also mention that libraries do tend to see um, increases in checkout rates with RFID because people prefer self-checkout systems in a lot of cases. Um, they like the ease of it that they can handle it on their own, um, not have to interact with anyone. Um, so sometimes libraries will see up to a 40% increase in circulation. And it does also offer privacy to the patrons so that if they want to check out material that's a bit sensitive, um, they don't have to go uh, talk to someone physically to check out their item. They can just put it on top of the self-checkout station and walk right out the door with it. All right. That looks like everything. All right. Thanks, Thomas.
thank you everyone for joining us um again we'll be sending you a recording in the next few weeks